Amen. Now that'll preach. Amen. Amen. Yeah, absolutely. If something like that doesn't light your fire, your wood's wet. All right? So that should get you excited about what Jesus is doing. All right, people of the book, raise it up high and proud. We love God's perfect and inspired word here at the Mission Church of Lexington. I thought about preaching a message on the sin of procrastination for the first message of the new year, but I never got around to it. So we're going to be in Matthew, Matthew chapter 16 today. Matthew chapter 16. So we're not going to preach on procrastination, but we are going to preach on the church. This body of believers that God has planned before the creation of time to be His change agent in this world. Amen? So January and February to start 2019, we're going to walk through many passages together as a body of believers that talks about God's plan, God's purpose, God's dream for His church. Now friends, I want you to know there's a, there's, a, there's a universal church. Everybody who ever has loved Jesus and trusted the Gospel, both in the past and around the world today, are in the body of Jesus Christ. Amen? Isn't it good to know that we aren't the only ones? That we are not the only ones in this beautiful world that are lifting the name of Christ high. Is it good to know that we're not in this battle alone? That Jesus has called unto Himself people from all tribes and nations to be followers of His. Worshiping in different places and in different ways, but worshiping the same Jesus that we are worshiping here today at the Mission Church of Lexington. Understand the Bible clearly says that God has not changed. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the gospel of Jesus Christ never goes out of style. God's promises have no expiration date. That video clearly said the truth of the gospel. And that applies whether you are in Asia, you're in Africa, or you're in America. It applies to all of us. It says that humanity is born in this world, sinners by birth and by choice. That we can't help, it's our default setting, that we are separated from God because of this intrinsic thing inside of us. But God in His infinite love and grace and mercy reaches down and hand selects us to bring us into His family, to cause us to be a part of the body of Christ, to be able to be about His ministry. Amen? Amen. That's something worth giving your life for. That's something big enough that it should keep you up at night and get you up early in the morning. That is something that God's asking you to be a part of that's worth committing your life to, if necessary, willing to give your life for. Amen? Amen. It's something that I'm excited about, and I want you to be excited about it as well. We started this church just a year ago. And a year ago, the first thing we really started was the essentials of the church. Remember those of you who were here? We began that study talking about the importance of the church. We want to see the blueprint for the kind of church that God wanted us to be. We don't believe that there's time for business as usual. We believe it's time to do something different. And not necessarily different. We want to do something that is biblical. So we're not trying to find something new. We're trying to rediscover the old way, right? Doing things God's way. Putting God's word first. Amen? Double idea. Putting missions as a super high priority. Making prayer a foundation for what we do. These are the basic things that we as the church have gotten away from over the years. And shame on us for that. But we have the privilege here at the Mission Church of Lexington to plant a brand new church and to be able to navigate this in the direction we believe that God wants us to do. Amen? So if we mess this thing up, we've got no one to blame but ourselves. <laughs> no pressure. Amen? We want to make sure we continue to follow God's blueprint. So January and February this year, to start the year off, this is a reset, a recalibration, to make sure that we are moving in the direction that God wants us to do. In the servant service today, an opportunity to teach our, our Levites about prayer. And we as a church have made prayer a foundational piece to the mission church from the very beginning. We believe that when we work, we work. But when we pray, God works. And we want God to work, right? We want to do things that are so amazing and so supernatural that only God can get the credit for it. And I believe we've seen that through 2018. 
I think God has done some things in this body of believers that we have to say, man, God, if you didn't do that, it wasn't going to happen. And that's stuff I want to be a part of. That's what we want to see in the local church. Because when that's happening, it builds our faith up. And a watching world says, man, I want in on that. I want to know that same Jesus that you know. I want that same kind of impact in my life that you have. And we've seen that taking place this year. And I think we've just begun to scratch the surface. I think we are just at the cusp of what God wants us to do. This past year, our, our line was, hey, God's doing great things, but the best is yet to come, right? We're looking forward. That needs to be our goal in our personal lives and in our church, that we don't spend a whole lot of time in the rear view mirror. Man, we're looking forward. God, what are you wanting us to do next for you? It's okay to visit the past. You want to celebrate the past, but you don't want to live there. You want to say, God, what is it you want me to do next? Because that's the way God always works. God never wants us to shift into spiritual neutral. There is no such thing as spiritual neutral. If you're in neutral, you're coasting back. Jesus wants your foot on the accelerator. The time is drawing God. We never have a guarantee of tomorrow. Christ could come back at any point. We want to make sure that we have a whole load together ready to be with Him. Amen? We need to be passionate, active, moving for Jesus, growing daily, never in spiritual neutral. But this year, our motto that we have as a church is, God, we're saying yes, even before knowing all the details. So we're saying, God, oh, we want to walk in faith. God, we don't have to know plan A, B, C, and D, every step of it. God, you just give us an inkling of what you want us to do, and we're setting on ready to do it. Amen? It doesn't mean that we do willy-nilly foolish stuff. We count the cost. We do our homework. We do what we're supposed to do. But we're also ready to say yes to Jesus. God, you show us what you want. We're saying yes to you. I think that's what we saw all through the book of Acts, right? And we studied the book of Acts together. We talked about how they did so much with so little. But today we do so little with so much. Well, what's the difference? They were willing to live lives of reckless abandon for Jesus. They were ready to do anything that God wanted them to do. They were willing to give up, give in, give out, do what Christ wants them to do without any kind of hesitation. If we want to experience what they experienced, we've got to be obedient the way they were obedient. Amen? That's my heart's desire for this year. I want us, the Mission Church of Lex, this local church, and there's a universal church, but we are a physical expression of that, this local church, full of uniquenesses, full of brokenness, full of dysfunction. We put the fun and dysfunction around here, guys. But that's what Jesus likes. Jesus wants to take all of our humanness has been baptized by Jesus Christ and use it for His glory. Amen? Amen? God wants to use this mess in this room, people like me and people like you, to do something that gives Him glory, that invites people into that story of redemption. Understand, none of this is about us. This church isn't about us. It's not about making us feel comfortable or welcome or making sure we sing the songs we want or whatever. It's about those who are not yet here. Friends, that is my mission, if I have any mission as your pastor, is to help us as a church to make decisions not based on those who are here, but on those who are not yet here. Those who are outside of the kingdom of God. Those who have not been a part of the church. Those who yet need to hear that life-changing gospel of Christ. Those are the decisions we're making for. Amen? That's how we're going to use our time. That's how we're going to use our money. That's how we're going to make our plans and our visions. How can we give God greater glory and bring other people into the story that God is writing with us, the Mission Church of Lexington? Friends, that should get you excited. Understand, if you walk around our city and visit lots of churches, there's a lot of motivations for what they do. But sometimes it's not, not that clear cut. Because we want to keep things simple. We don't want to muddy the waters. We want to keep this thing so it's about Jesus. A Bible-based, mission-minded church for God's glory. Amen? A artist was commissioned to paint a picture that represented, that showed a dead church. So he took this uh, initiative and he painted this picture that was a beautiful church sanctuary. The pews were pristine. The colors on the walls were 
were uh, just a beautiful color, stained glass windows, a nice high platform, a beautiful ornate podium. You had a full orchestra, a full um, uh, choir with their robes on. Everybody looked squared away with their suits, their ties, their outfit together. And someone said, well, this doesn't look like a dead church. This looks like a church that's alive and full of resources. The artist said, well, look real closely at the baptistry. And in the baptistry, it painted cobwebs in the baptistry. That was a subtle way of making a point. You can be running on empty and look okay on the outside. Unless those baptism waters are stirred, which is symbolic of seeing people take a relationship with Christ personally, it's a dead church. And we have churches all across our city, all across our state, all across our country, all around the world where they're dead. They're spiritually dead. They may look like they have life on the outside, but they're empty on the inside. God help us. That's ever our situation. We're not so concerned with the outside. We're concerned with the inside. Amen? Amen. That's the way God always does things. It says in 1 Samuel 17 that man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. We want to see people consistently making decisions to take their next step of obedience to Christ. That means that someone is saying, I am trusting Christ as my Lord and my Savior, and I'm not ashamed of it. That means that we have people who are following the Lord and believers' baptism was their public profession. I am a committed Christ follower, not ashamed to be identified with the death and the burial of Christ, dying to the old way of life, rising to walk in the newness of life. We're seeing people being committed to studying their Bible. We, want to be, we believe with all of our hearts what you do with your Bible will determine what God does with you. We want you in God's Word. Not just under the preaching and teaching, but in the Word yourself. You say, Preach, I don't know how to do that. On the table in the Connection Center, there's a year-long Bible reading plan. That's a great place to start. We want to see people being true intercessors. They're really praying and speaking to God and searching God's heart. That's what we talked about the servant service today. We want to see people sharing their faith. That's a novel idea that we talk about Christ. That should be the normal for every child of God. Jesus should be so exciting to you. There's an important part of your life that you can't help but to talk about it. That God is just a natural part of your communication. When a person gets saved, it should be able to eliminate about the half their vocabulary. It takes away all the cuss words, all the cussing, all the light, and then adds to it the gospel of Jesus Christ. That He's quickly on our lips. It's something we bring up often in our conversations. All these ways is what we're looking for. We want to see God working in this church. Not just the formalities. Amen? Not just the religious activity. It's so easy for us to fall into religious activity. What's religious activity? That's when you learn the what, but forget the why. We learn the what of how to do things. We know what to wear, the Bible to care. We know some Christianese. We know how to you know, raise our hand at the right time, clap at the right time, nod our head when the preacher's preaching. We know some of those things. We've forgotten the why. Why are we doing this? Why are we committed to this thing called the church? Why are we a part of the body of Christ? And that's what we're going to be talking about in the next couple of months. So, Here's some of the whys behind the what. This is why the church is important. Number one, these are not on the screen, these are my different ones. All right? There's 200 million non-churched people in America. Did you know that America is the fourth largest unchurched nation in the world? That's a big number, right? America used to be the staunch foundation cornerstone of Christianity sending missionaries around the world. I think we probably are still sending more mission money around the world than the other nation. Boy, we're really losing ground quickly. Our ethos of Christianity, of commitment to missions, of being a Bible-based community, a world, of a country, is quickly declining. The needs are rising on a daily basis. There are approximately 3,200 non-reach people groups around the world. That means not even just in America, 
but around the world there are people groups and tribes and peoples that have never even had an opportunity to hear the gospel. They get born and they die with ev without ever hearing the good news. That's shocking to us. It should be appalling to us. We are oversaturated here in America with the gospel. So oversaturated that we take it for granted. We hear it and see it, have exposure to it, have resources out our ears, and yet it goes in one ear and out the other and other places around the world. People live and die without ever hearing the truth of the gospel. That's something that should grab our attention. That should be something we said, I don't want people to die and go to hell. I want people to be able to be in right relationship with God and go to heaven. Something worth giving our lives for. We also know that 3,500 churches close their doors every year. As 3,500 churches that were once a Bible preaching, Bible treat preaching in a gospel evangelizing community that now they've closed their... How that happened? They lost their first love. Understand it's not usually the blowout that gets you. It's a slow fade, right? They began a slow fade. And it usually becomes untethered from God's Word. And when you get untethered from God's Word, you can flow to all kinds of different places. And you have these churches that were once a standard of Bible preaching and teaching where people are being saved and changed, they're now bars. Or they're now uh, Italian restaurants. Or they're now Islamic centers. I know a church here in town, a buddy of mine, going through a hard time. Church looking to transition. Need to sell their property. I guess some people wanting to buy their property. Islamic group. Europe. Look at Europe. The situation they're in for about 25 years. You always follow Europe about 25 year increments. If you look where Europe is today, where America will be in 25 years, except for God intervention. Amen. That should be a wake up call for us. And then even the churches that we do have that aren't closing the door, four out of five of those churches are either plateaued or declining. I mean, they're just like the portrait that we have. They're just plateaued. The only thing that happens is some people die and they begin to say, hey, last one out, turn the lights off. God forbid that would ever be us. Plateaued or declining. There's too much work to be done to be plateaued or declining. We need to be zealously following after Christ. Charles Colson in a book called The Body, he gave us uh, four purposes of the church. And I think these four purposes are applicable to our personal lives. So these things the church is supposed to do also applies to us in the vision. Number one, he says the church is to exalt God in worship. Exalt God in worship. We just did that a few moments ago through singing, right? But singing is not the only form of worship. Singing is one of many forms of worship. Worship is simply everything you do, it's about God. God takes the normal, mundane, everything that you do in life, when you turn it to God for His glory, that is worship. That's the result of the church, and that should be our personal lives as well. We live lives of worship. Number two, Charles Colson says that we are to evangelize, bringing the lost into a saving relationship with the Lord. Can't talk too much about that. It's not about us, it's about those who need to come to faith in Christ. Number three is to edify, taking new Christians and maturing them into deeper faith. Now, most churches have a balance here that they either overemphasize one or the other, either evangelism or discipleship, right? Either they're over and it's about how many more people can we get through the doors and make a profession of faith in Christ. And the problem with that is it can be inflated numbers. Sometimes you're pushing people into it to make a profession of faith. They really don't know what they're doing. It's all about this. And before long, they're now in the church, but they don't have any way to keep them in the church. That's the church to have a wide front door, but also a wide back door as well. People say, yeah, I love Jesus, but like two months later, where are they at? We don't want that to happen to us either. 
But then you have the flip side where people are so closed front door that they say, hey, let's preach and let's teach and let's have everybody have Bible studies where they grow in their faith, but they're never reaching anybody else. Never bringing anybody into the family of God. And the problem with Bible studies is this. Bible study in itself is not the end. It's a means to the end. Bible study and learning God's Word and having more lessons and more discipleship studies is not about simply having more information crammed into your cranium. It's how can God get that in you then to work through you, to allow you to be a better worshiper of the Lord and be a better witness for Him. God wants that from us, His people. Then also to extend reaching out to the community to meet physical, spiritual, relational, and emotional needs. I love Acts when it says, or Matthew says that Jesus went about doing good to all those who came into contact with. We need to be a church that our community knows it's here, that knows that we're here for the good of our community, that we're not just trying to take from the community and not pay our property taxes. It's about how can we love our community in the name of Jesus, right? That's why we have a team set up, community compassion team, Danny and Cheryl Walker. But it's not just a team that does that. We're all to do that. That our daily responsibility in the normal traffic patterns of your life. That your little spiritual antennas up looking for people who have needs that you can practically fill. You can't do everything, but you can do something. You've got to be aware of those. Whenever those opportunities arise and God impresses your heart, guess what? You better do it. God's invitation is your invite to obedience. God won't force you to do it, but you're going to miss out on God's best if you don't. God's the one that always makes the appointment, but you've got to keep it. God's going to bring people in your life every day even if it's just a simple word of encouragement, even if it's a simple, hey, I am praying for you, then guess what? You actually pray for them. Maybe you meet an actual tangible need in some practical way. Whatever it is, you do that in the name of Christ. And when they recognize that you did something kind for them, and they say, thank you so much for doing that, as quickly as you can, then you send that conversation towards God. Amen? <coughs> It's not about what a great person you are. People are not saved by our good lives. They're saved by Jesus and His work for us. Amen? Our mission statement here at the Mission Church is we exist to enlist unbelievers, equip believers, and empower missionaries. So we want the whole concept. We want to bring people into the family of God we want to rise them up to be strong Christ followers, and we want to be able to send them out. Every member a missionary. Every member a minister. We're also giving and going in missions, both local and abroad. We as a church have a core commitment. We give 10% of our undesignated giving straight to missions. So we are, quote, a tithing church. Amen? 10% of our, our work here. The giving goes straight from missionaries getting the gospel out around the world. We have that as a high value in this church. So that brings us to our passage today. That was a long introduction. Matthew 16. Quickly, it's on the screen if you don't have it. The message today is the divine carpenter is building his church. The divine carpenter, Jesus, is building his church. This is in Matthew chapter 16. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, He asked His disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of Hades or hell shall not prevail against it. So in Bible study, there's a law called the Law of First Mention. So when you're studying biblical truths, 
topics, you always want to try to track it down to the first time that truth or that concept is mentioned in Scripture. Now, the church, I believe, was on God's mind, obviously, before eternity. I know that we were. The Bible says that Christ was slain before the foundation of the world for us. But the, the teaching, God's revelation of the church, didn't take place in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, it talked about the nation of Israel, the kingdom of God that was going to be established, almost like two mountain peaks. And in between was the valley that the Jewish people couldn't see the valley. They saw this mountain and then over to the next mountain, waiting for the Messiah to come back to reestablish His kingdom. But God in His infinite wisdom and His providential care had this plan for the church, the Gentiles, to bring us into His forever family. We were the valley. We were the church in the valley that they didn't see in the Old Testament. It was called a mystery. And a mystery is not like an Agatha Christie novel. A mystery is a, a sacred secret. Something that God had in the recesses of His mind, but for whatever reason did not reveal it to the nation of Israel. But that progressive revelation that revealed it later on. And this is the first time that we see the concept of church spoken in the Bible by Jesus Christ. Now we know from reading the book of Acts and studying the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2 is the day of Pentecost. You remember that, right? Where they were praying and waiting for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came. They spoke in foreign languages. It was all about getting the gospel out to those who are from all over the known world who are in Jerusalem for the high feast day. We call that the birthday of the church. I tweak that a little bit. I think that's the day the church was empowered. I think in Matthew chapter 16 was the day the church was established. Here Jesus, talking to His disciples, way up in the northern part of the country, began to speak to them this concept of the church, began to materialize. The next time we see it is in Matthew 18, talking about church discipline. And then we see it kind of really come together in the book of Acts. So Jesus is the initiate. He's the divine carpenter who builds His church. Now you remember Jesus' earthly ministry, right? He was the son of a carpenter. He was son of Joseph, who was a carpenter. And in that day and time, there was a, G there was a Jewish proverb that said to teach your son, or not to teach your son a trade, is to teach him to steal. <laughs> That's a good model. We should use that today. So you know that Jesus, as a boy, sat at the feet of his earthly father and taught him a trade. Taught him how to hammer, how to saw, how to put things together. Jesus learned this trade. But Jesus' construction did not end as a boy. He became a, uh, an evangelist. He became the teacher. He began to travel and preach and teach at 30. And he was building into people's lives. He did life with people, taught them truth, and helped them to take their next spiritual step of obedience. He's still building people. He chose these 12 ragamuffin band. Guys who no one else would have selected. If God were not the author of the Bible, if a human was, we would have had Jesus choosing the Pharisees, right? Or somebody of power, prestige, or influence. But because God is the author, it says that Jesus chose weaklings, the foolish, poor, uneducated fishermen, tax collectors, Zealous people that were the scourge of society. Thank God that's the kind of people God chooses. Amen. It says that He built into their lives. He invested in them to help them to be all that God wanted them to be. And then we see here it says that God is building His church. I will build my church. And that's a project that's still continuing today. And each one of us are a small stone in this building. Amen? That we get to be together this beautiful building of God called the body of Christ, the church of Jesus. In this pastor, we'll look at just a few points. Number one, now this is in your worship order. All right. Number one, it's the request. First thing we have is the request. When Jesus came into the reach of Caesarea Philippi, He asked His disciples, saying, Who do men say that I... The Son of Man and So here was the normal routine. Jesus walked the dusty streets of Israel. Here they found themselves way up north in Caesarea Philippi. That's the farthest north part of the nation of Israel at that time. 
This was kind of the beginning of the fresh body of water. It was a very unique place known for a lot of pagan rituals. And Jesus took them straight to this place. I love that Jesus always has His plan not to try to isolate or avoid the hard things. He took them right to the heart of sin. He said, I want you to be a witness and a light here and now. Amen? That's what God wants for us. God doesn't want us to be necessarily uh, monks living in a monastery, isolating from the world. He also doesn't want the world to corrupt us, but He wants us to be a witness in the world. Amen? Almost like a boat, right? A boat in the water, and the ocean's a great thing, but when the ocean or the water gets in the boat, it's a bad thing. God wants us to be in the world, but not of the world. And here He asks them a very probing and a very important question. Who do men say that I am? God is still asking that question today. Who is Jesus? Now, we can't just make up a figment of our imaginations, Jesus. We can't just have a Jesus that we create in our own minds. We can't just have a Jesus and wear a t-shirt and say, Jesus is my homeboy, alright? We need to have the Jesus that's truly revealed in God's Scripture. We need to understand who Christ is the way He's actually revealed and believe in that Jesus. Because I want you to know that Jesus was not just an ethereal kind of a spirit, kind of a folklore, made up kind of a thing. If you had your time machine, you jump in your DeLorean, you go back in time, you would have been able to spend time with Jesus. You would have been able to see Him, touch Him, know Him, hear Him. You would have had a Jesus, God in the flesh, that you would have been able to see and understand and know. Just because it's been 2,000 years doesn't mean that Christ has changed. He is still he who He is. And we need to know Him and believe Him for who He is. Jesus is not there just to be a, uh, uh, you know, a genie in a bottle for us. Jesus is real Son of God that died for our sins. Can you say who He really is in your life? Who is Jesus to you? Understand, our biggest problem as human beings is our small view of God. That's our biggest problem. When you get a right view of Jesus, a right view of God, everything else tends to come in, in order. Amen? It's been said before that the most important thing about man is that man thinks about God. That's why theology, that's why Bible says, that's why doctrine is so important. We want to know who God is and what that means for our lives. That's the, that is the uh, first point. That's the request number two. The rumors. The rumors. Verse 14. So they said, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. So, there was a lot of opinions on who Christ was. Some thought it was John the Baptist, the strong preacher, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And, and that was true. But that was only one aspect of who Christ was. Remember Herod that had John the Baptist killed by, by beheading? He had a guilty conscience. Remember, when he heard about Jesus, this is John the Baptist, come back from the grave. It's amazing that the conviction and sin that can bring upon somebody, that conviction and sin, unfortunately, did not lead to repentance and faith for Herod. So some thought it was John the Baptist, a strong, unique, prophetic preacher. Some thought it was Elijah. Simply someone who did miracles. Almost like a carnival sideshow. And many people followed Jesus for that reason. That they would come and follow Jesus because they wanted some free meals, right? They wanted to see Jesus multiply the fish and the bread. Or they wanted to see Jesus walk on water. Or they wanted to see Jesus raise somebody from the dead. They just wanted a cheap experience. That was almost like what happened when Pilate sent Jesus off and uh, Herod wanted to see a trick by Jesus. And when Jesus wouldn't do it, Herod had no use for it. How many of us fall into that trap? Whenever Jesus doesn't do what we want Him to do, then we don't have any time for Him. When Jesus doesn't fix all the mess that we've created, then we say, God, I don't know if I'm really all that excited about You anymore. Here's what I have learned. That people use Jesus as a good luck charm. I remember talking to this one guy that I was ministering to, and he found himself in quite a pickle. He thought he had his uh, girlfriend pregnant. 
and his other girlfriend pregnant at the same time. And uh, he thought that was a big mess, right? And so he all of a sudden got super spiritual. <laughs> Carrying his Bible everywhere, praying, talking about Jesus stuff. And then when he found out that one of the girls was playing a trick on him and wasn't actually pregnant, all of a sudden, Jesus wasn't a big part of his equation anymore. So what was he doing? Using Jesus as a good love charm. So much more than that, amen. He's so much more than just someone that you call on to do a miracle in your life. He can do that. But the bigger question is, can you love Jesus even when he's not doing the miracle that you think he should be doing? Or Jeremiah. Jeremiah is sitting, it's called the weeping prophet of the Old Testament. Someone whose heart breaks. Kind of a, a kind of a, if you want to think of a, a, a softy in some regards. Some people thought Jesus was just one whose heart broke over sin and that he didn't have any stance for what was right or hard or real. So here you have aspects of who Christ is, but not the full picture. And you have a full understanding of Christ. That was the rumors. Number three is the recognition. The recognition. 15 through 17. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And that's the personal piece. It really doesn't matter what other people say about Jesus. What do you say about Jesus? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ. The Son of the Living God. And this is Simon Peter, who was a fisherman. And Jesus said, Come follow me. And through this ministry time, God revealed to Peter Jesus' real identity. This shows us that even one of the disciples named Judas, right, had many of the similar experiences. He was probably here at Caesarea Philippi. He saw the same things, heard the same things. Yet he did not believe. So that shows us that we can have people even exposed to biblical truth, even sitting in this room today, to have a good outward expression of pious religious behavior and attitude, but in your heart, you know you're far from God. God's asking you today, who am I to you? Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. My Father who is in heaven. Remember, my friends, every salvation experience is a supernatural work. God asks us to do our part. We're to share the Gospel. But only God can make that truth real in someone's heart. Only God can turn that light switch on. Amen? Only God can make that happen. God revealed this truth to Peter. And Peter responded in so there we have the recognition. And then finally, the result. Here's the result. Verse 18. And I also say to you that you are Peter. Remember the word Peter means stone. Right? Peter the stone. His name before this was Simon, right? Change it to Peter the stone. And on this rock, kind of a wordplay, Peter, the small stone, is placed upon the rock. I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Obviously, we know that this is a verse that's used strongly by some to think that Peter was like the rock, the foundation of the church. I think that is a little misinterpretation. This is saying, Jesus saying, Peter, you're the small stone. You only know this because God revealed it to you. I'm going to build this thing called the church on this rock. What was the rock? The profession that Peter just made. Peter said, Jesus, you are the Son of God. You're the only one that can give us hope and help and a future. It's only through you that we can have spiritual life. Jesus said, it's upon this truth, upon this rock upon this foundation that I'll build my church. Friends, Peter was just like you and me. Peter had the foibles and the, and the foolishness that we have today, yet he knew the divine truth. He knew the reality of Christ. And Jesus said, it's that common denominator that I'm going to build my church upon. So whether you lived 2,000 years ago with Peter, or you live today, is that truth that Jesus is the Son of God. That Jesus is the one that grants you forgiveness of sins, 
purpose of life, home in heaven. It's that truth that Jesus is building His church on. I love it says here, that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So this shows that we as the church, we are uh, on the offense. Many times we try to hunker down and have our spiritual walls up like the devil's attacking us and getting the victory over us, but we just got to bar the windows and hold the devil out. That's what this says. It says that, that, that Hades or hell is the one that has the gate. What's a gate do? It just tries to hold its block. We are the church. We are attacking, charging the gate of hell. How do we do that? With this message. Jesus is the Son of God. That you don't have to stay the way you are. That you don't have to be forever in your sins, separated from God, but you can be in right standing with God through the work that Christ did for you. That's good news, amen? That's what the church has built on. Quickly to close up on his last point, there's two ways that Jesus builds this church. Number one, Jesus builds this church from without. From without. Outside. Outside. Remember when Jesus called His disciples said in Matthew 4.19, Follow Me and I will make you fishers of men. So Jesus' earthly life was about drawing people into a right relationship with Him. When He ascended and went back to heaven, ten days later sent the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2 were to continue the work that He began drawing people to Jesus. So the two commands that Christ gives everybody is come to Me then go for me. Come to me in salvation. Come to me for a relationship. And then you go for me to be a witness and a minister to the world. Amen? That's the great commandment. The great commission. There's our two foundational verses. Matthew 22. Love God. Love others as you love yourself. The great commandment. The great commission is take the Gospel to the entire world and help them to be mature Christ followers. That's the foundational chapter, verse from this church. We believe that's in obedience with Jesus' will to build His church from without. But also, number two, or B, number B, Jesus builds His church from within. So He's reaching out, drawing people in, but He's also building us up on the inside. So 1 Corinthians 14.12 He says that He gives every child of God spiritual gifts. And He says, let it be for the edification of the church. The building up of the church. Spiritual growth. Understand that the day you came to faith in Christ should not be your high spiritual watermark. That's the beginning, not the end. Understand that you should be able to look at your life and see spiritual growth. It may not be as quick as you want it to be, but you should see growth in your life. I encourage you this Sunday, the first Sunday in 2019, to look at your life. Do some honest evaluating. Understand you'll hit every target that you uh, don't make, right? So you want to have a target, a goal for what you want God to do in your life in the new year. So look in the past to the present. Has there been growth? Am I loving Jesus more? And sometimes it's not just a list of things you're doing. It's just use your heart to turn more to Jesus. Like if you were to ask me, hey Donovan, do you love Miss Becky? And I said, well sure I do. I've been mowing the grass, sweeping the floors, and taking out the trash. And I don't know what I'm asking. Do you love her? Spiritual practices help with that. Are you loving Jesus more? At the end of 2019, can you say that you love Jesus even more and serving Him even better and be used by Him in an even greater way? I understand that most Christians have, you know, not 20 years of experience. They have one experience 20 times, right? They do the same old things. You talk to someone 20 years later and they struggle with the same stuff, praying about the same things. Oh God, help me quit drinking. Oh God, help me quit chewing, smoking. Help me quit lying. It's been five years ago. Let God do a work in your life. 
let there be some transformation that takes place. Whatever Jesus touches, He changes. Here's the last phrase I'll give you. You have as much of Jesus as you want. That means as much as you're willing to yield to Him. As much as you're willing to, to sacrifice for Him. As much obedience as you want. You have as much of Christ as you want in your life. James 4 8 says, Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. Because we're the church. It's time for us to act like it. Amen. Let's pray. Let's bow eyes closed.